a lot of devil stuff, a lot of reds and yellows too, uh, but uh, good morning, my 1030 friends. I am Talbot Davis. I'm the pastor here, and you have made it for the very first Sunday of a one-of-its-kind series at Good Shepherd Church, or even in my the entire time I've been in full-time ministry, more than 30 years. I've never done a series where we are going to devote four weeks to talking about Satan until this series. It's called The Devil's Details. Today, the first message in the series is called Satan's Native Language, Satan's native language. And so if you have your Bible with you, I want to invite you to locate. Maybe your Bible looks like mine, looks like a book. Maybe it's on your phone. Either way, go ahead and locate the Gospel of John, which is in the New Testament, chapter 8, verses 41 through 44. And if you didn't bring your Bible and it's, and it's not an app on your phone, that's okay. The words will be up on the screen when they need to be. And, and all that kind of has a, a, a deep uh, rationale. There's a deep rationale for all of that in, in what we believe at this church. One of those things that, that we believe that is a fact is that the Bible, although this looks like a book, this is absolutely not a book. It's a library. You, you may not have heard that before, or you may know it quite well, but it, it, the Bible is not the good book. It's the great library written by a lot of authors over a long span of time and in multiple writing styles. When we're in John, we're in the section of the library that's devoted to biography. There are four biographies in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and one subject, Jesus. And that's just a fact. People don't always know it, but it is a fact that we remind ourselves about. Then we also have this deeply held conviction that you may or may not be on board with yet. And, and either way there is fine, but here it is. We believe in leadership here that there's no other library like this one on earth, that God breathed his life into John's words, and he, believed his, he breathed his life into the words of the other authors of Scripture, and he put his truth onto their pages. We actually believe here the Bible is inspired and eternal and true. And out of that, out of that belief that we have at this place comes, this, comes a custom that we have. We have a conviction that leads to a custom, and the custom is this. When we talk about the Bible together... We lift it up. And if you hadn't been here before, you're, you're like, whoa, that's unusual, that's strange, that's a little bit odd. Check, check, check. We admit all of it. But we've discovered that this is a moment of oddity, shapes our identity as a community. We are a collection of people who do not have life figured out very well, and most of us have the scars to prove it. But we know who does. And because we know who does, we're glad to surrender to his authority. Amen? Amen? And so before I say another word, let's pray. God, thank you that your word is good and, and, and that the same Holy Spirit who inspired John is very much alive and very much active today. And so I pray that Holy Spirit would just overwhelm the people of Good Shepherd today so that it's unmistakable we've been in your house and in your presence Fill me as a messenger from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Everything that's good and right and true about the Spirit of God. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, here is uh, something that I know that is true about you and is true about me. And it's true about all of us. And it's this, no one wakes up one morning and decides, I am going to do the worst thing ever today. Today's the day. I am going to blow up my life. No one does that. It's not anyone's New Year's resolution. By this time next year, I'm going to ruin my life. It's not part of your five-year personal development plan. Five years from now, I'm going to blow everything up. It's not on your to-do list today. Okay, got to get up, going to have lunch, going to go to that meeting, and then the last thing on my to-do list, I'm going to ruin this life that I've built together. You didn't major in college, those of you who went to college. You did not major in how to blow your life up. Nobody does that. That's nobody's plan, I can safely say that's true about all of us, and yet, here you are, or were, 
or you're headed there in divorce court again, at a custody hearing, beating up a guy in a bar, getting beaten up by a guy in a bar, <laughs> fleeing an abusive relationship again, barely able to get out of bed in the morning, charged with death by motor vehicle in rehab again. Now, no one started out the day to land there. And yet landing there is exactly what you have done. And so the question becomes, how in the world did I start out at point A and with mostly good intentions? How did I get to point B, the worst point possible? How did I start out this journey of life with good intentions and then ended up in the worst of locations? And if you're thinking that I'm going to end this message by saying, because the series is called The Devil's Details, that I'm going to say, well, the devil made me do it. Nope. That's not what we believe. That's not where this message is headed. Instead, to help us answer that question, since none of us wanted to do the worst thing ever, and yet we did. I want to introduce you to some guys who surrounded Jesus in this story that we are going to look at in John chapter 8. Now, in John chapter 8, Jesus is relatively early in his ministry. And he's really going public with who he is. And he's in a place called the Jerusalem temple, the temple in the city of Jerusalem, which is the seat of power and the seat of faith and the seat of influence in the Jewish faith. I mean, Jesus is surrounded by the elite of the elite when it came to Judaism. And in particular, there are people who are surrounding him that day in the temple with these names that you may or may not have heard of, the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, we, in the year 2024, we hear terms like scribes and Pharisees, and if you've been around church at all, and if you haven't, that's okay, but if you've been around church at all, we immediately think those are the bad guys, scribes and Pharisees, bad. And the only reason we think that is because we've had 2,000 years of being told that. But actually, in the story, in John chapter 8, in the temple that day, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're the good guys. They are the ones who have devoted themselves to the things of God. Scribes and Pharisees are the kind of people who, if you're a pastor and they show up at your church, the church you're serving, you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus, for sending me a scribe and a Pharisee because they're going be ev- to be there every single Sunday. They're going to get in the life group and they're going to tithe. That's what, we, that's, that's, what, that's what pastors would do if a scribe and a Pharisee showed up. And, and for a variety of reasons, When Jesus stands up and gives this address in John chapter 8, the scribes and the Pharisees do not respond positively to his message, nor are they particularly fond of his critique of their job performance. And so they decide to take their disagreement with Jesus public there in the Jerusalem temple. I mean, I would have been all all like, hey, hey, Mr. Christ, can we talk about this behind closed doors? You you, you Nazarene whippersnapper, you. Let's talk about this in private. And and the scribes and the Pharisees are all like, no, let's get it out in the open. And, And so that's what's surrounding Jesus when he's speaking in John chapter 8. And look at what Jesus says. In John chapter 8, verses 42 and 43, look at what it says. It says this, Jesus said to them, and with them as the scribes and the Pharisees, we've been conditioned to think they're thinking they're bad in the setting. They're the good guys. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. So so what Jesus is kind of complaining about here is that they don't get him. And 
And isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting how, how little things have changed? Like when people don't get us, we just get so frustrated. You don't understand me. You don't know my motivations. You don't get me. And then, and then when someone does get us, our hearts get all fluttered and we, we kind of fall in love all over. Oh, you get me. You understand me. And that's what Jesus is dealing with, aside from the love part, dealing with a little bit. These Pharisees and scribe guys, they do not get him. And then Jesus goes on. First part of verse 44. Look what he says. You belong to your father, comma, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Well, here's, here's what you do. Next, next time somebody doesn't get you, you just tell them, you just belong to your father, the devil, and that's why you don't, that's why you don't understand me. See how that goes over. Like you, you ask a girl out, and she doesn't think you're cool, and she says no, and you just say, well, that's because you belong to Satan. Let me go on to the next one. Or, 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 or you, get a, you get a job performance review at work, and, and it doesn't go your way. And you're like, well, you just, okay, I know why. You, you belong to your father, the devil. Let's say that. That's why. The, you know Jesus did not win a whole lot of friends in this particular moment to the scribes. And the Pharisees. But aside from that, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta wait. We gotta hold on right here for just a darn minute. Because I bet there are some of you here today and you like Jesus. Or or you like what you've heard about Jesus. You don't really like church very much, but you like Jesus. And you're seeing right here. That, that not only it's bad enough that Jesus called these guys the devil, what's even worse in your mind is that Jesus actually believed in a devil. And, and, and so you're, inside you're like, those of you who come to church and you like Jesus, you don't really like church and like what you've heard about Jesus, you're, 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 you want to say to me, wait a minute there, mister. Are you telling me that this Jesus, this Jesus who I like, this Jesus who loved all the little children, Jesus who told us to love our enemies. Jesus who taught us that the greatest virtue of them all is tolerance. Thank you. This Jesus, this, this Jesus who definitely wanted us all spiritual and not all religious. This Jesus who looked like this guy. Are you telling me that that Jesus now, are you telling me that that Jesus believed in a literal red devil with horns and a pitchfork? Is that what you're telling me, Reverend Talbot? First of all, it's Reverend Davis. It's, it's not Reverend Talbot. Met my woman who became my daughter-in-law. She's my daughter-in-law now. Met her about eight years ago, and she, she called me Mr. Davis. And I said, hold on there, Natalie. That's Reverend Davis to you. And, and we wonder why there's tension in the relationship. So... <laughs> Talbot is my first name. And you're like, Talbot, are you telling me that Jesus believed in a literal red devil with horns and pitchforks? And I am not telling you that. Jesus did not believe in a literal red devil with horns and a pitchfork. He did not believe in that. He believed in a literal devil who was much more malignant and much worse. You may not believe in the devil, but Jesus did. And in the same way that you can't see germs and you can't see viruses, and yet they make you sick, that this devil, this malignant dangerous devil whom Jesus very much believes in. He so fills the air with lies and deception that you don't even realize how much of it you are buying. Jesus believed in that kind of devil and in that kind of Satan. And the good guys in the story, the scribes and the Pharisees, they belonged to that devil and they did not even know it. And then Jesus goes on. And he gives his doctrine of Satan in a sentence. Look at what verse 44, the, the next part of verse 44 says, he, this is speaking of Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning 
not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a lie, he is a liar, and the father of lies. <laughs> you, so it's, see that first word, he, and it's followed by he, and he, and he, three he's, and a his, and the father, and, and all this masculine language for Satan. It's so interesting. You, you may not know this, but in the, in, in the last 50 years or so, in, in church world, not this church, but church world or kind of globally or nationally, there's been this effort in some churches to what they call remove masculine language for God. Like, no longer call God Father, He, or Him. That we want to demasculinize how we talk. It doesn't matter what, that Jesus called Him Father. We're not supposed to call Him Father, He, or Him anymore. And so, what ends up happening is that you'll have these people will go through the hymn. Y'all know what a hymnal is? Go, go through a hymnal. I remember being in one of these meetings like 40 years ago, and we're going through the hymnal, and we're trying to decide all the songs we're not going to sing anymore because they have masculine language for God. And, or, or you land in a place where you just use the word God like a million times in a sentence to avoid using he, him, or his. So like, for God so loved the world that God gave God's only child so that whoever would believe in God's only child would not... <sighs> well... As some of you didn't know that, was ha that had ever happened, and you're the better for not knowing it. I knew it was happening. And as you might be able to tell, I decided not to participate. Because if, if it was good enough for Jesus to call God Father, it's more than good enough for us. And, and at the end of the day, it's all just such baloney. But, but, whoa, I didn't expect that. You're lucky I didn't use a couple other words with an S and a B that, that describe... <laughs> But anyway, the, the reason I tell you all of that, Good Shepherd, is because in all that time of me being exposed to this idea, you got to remove the male language for God, I never, not once, not a single time ever heard anybody make the same argument for Satan. Well, we can't use masculine language for Satan anymore because we wouldn't want to offend people by referring to Satan as he or him or his. Never, not once. That was all free by the way, and, and you don't have to give a special offering when you leave or anything like that. That was all free. What's, what's maybe not free, what's really at the heart of, of, of what Jesus is saying is look at the last part of verse 44 again. When he lies, comma, he, not he or she, he, he speaks his native language. You know what, you know what that means? Satan Never had to take LSL. He never did. Lying as a second language. <laughs> he never had to take it. Lying is effortless to Satan. It comes naturally. If you grew up speaking English, you never had to take ESL. You didn't have to take English as a second language because English was your first language. It's your native language. It comes naturally and effortless to you. See, uh, if you grew up hablando espanol, la misma cosa para usted, you, you don't have to take Spanish. Come on. You don't have to take Spanish. You don't have to take Spanish as a second language e either because Spanish is the air that you breathe. It is natural. It is native. And so what Jesus is telling us is that Satan's lies, Satan's lying, his native language is deception. His currency is falsehood. And the lies that he crafts and the lies that he tells are everywhere for some reason. God allow, I don't know why, we'll know when we get to the other side, but God allows Satan to pepper our world with his lies. It is his native language. And he tells us the kind of lies that fill us with the most ridiculous assertions that lead us to making the most boneheaded of decisions. The kind of things that when we look back in retrospect, after we've made those decisions, after we've listened to his lies, and we look back in re retrospect, and you're like, ah, facepalm, how could I have been so dumb? How in the world could I have ever thought that that thing was a good thing when so obviously it was a terrible thing? How could I have thought that she was the answer to my problem? How could I have thought that he was better than my husband? 
How could I have fallen for that financial plan? How could I have listened to those voices that told me cutting would bring relief? That binging and purging would keep my body intact? How could I have listened to that advice to get that abortion or pay for it? How could I have been so dumb to listen to those voices that seem so sensible and seem so logical in the moment and now in the aftermath? I see all the havoc that they have brought on my life and on my soul and on my body. How could I have been such a fool to look at my life through those kind of lenses? How in the world that's what Satan does, that's the way that he operates to get you to make decisions in the moment based on his logic, based on sounds what, what sounds wise to him, and that you make those decisions and you enter those seasons of life and in the aftermath you are how in the world could I have been so foolish? Say you, you may not even believe in Satan, Jesus did, and the air that surrounds us is thick, thick with his lies. And you know how I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that what I am saying is true? Do you, do you know how I know for sure that Satan takes people who start out life with good intentions and then somehow at point A and somehow their point B is in, it ends up doing the worst thing ever, the worst thing possible? Because of the guys in John 8. Remember, they are the religious elite. They're the scribes and the Pharisees, the good guys in the story in John chapter 8. And how does their story end up? What do they end up doing in John chapters 18 and 19? They end up executing the king of the universe. They crucify their creator. That's what these guys, if you can do, if you can top that, on the list of worst things ever, I dare you to try. Actually, please don't try. <laughs> These guys who start out well, who start out life good, who are the spiritual elite, they end up life with the worst kind of blood on their hands. And they did not get there overnight. They did not wake up one morning and decide we're going to blow everything for everyone. They got there by and one lie after another. And you see, I have to believe that the Lord has brought you within the sound of my voice today to get you to that place where you will stop looking. I got myself a professional rear view mirror here. <laughs> so that you will stop looking in the rear view mirror of your life with so much remorse and thinking to yourself, how in the world could I have been so foolish? And instead of looking in the rearview mirror of your life with so much remorse, you will instead be able to look through the windshield of your life. Man, I wanted to get a real windshield here today. I worked and I tried and then I found out they are super heavy and I didn't want to break my back while giving you a, a message but because I knew a picture. I, I want you to move away from looking to here. Ah! How could I have done that? And instead, looking through that windshield and able to identify the lies before they ever come up and grab you, to be able to see the landmines before you ever step, one, step on one, to be able to see all of Satan's deceptions, the devil's details, so that you are able to say, no, nope, I can see that a mile away now, and I'm not falling for it again. Here's what I want you to know. Here's what we realize about the devil's details today. Identify the lies before they become regret. That's what I want. That, that, that's how you'll know Satan's details. You will be able to, no, nope, that's one. There's one. There's one. I am identifying that lie. I'm not falling for that one again. I'm identifying that lie way, way before it turns into regret. 
And the thing that I can't get away from in this story, John 8, John 18, 19, is that these were the good guys. These were the religious guys, the guys who belonged to Satan. Remember, Jesus said that. You don't get me, because Satan's your father. That they belonged to Satan, and they were the religious guys. They were sort of the heroes of the story. Which makes me realize Satan has not changed his strategy. The danger field has not altered. And it lets us know that those of you who are pastors or staffers or life group leaders or board members, that you have a special target on your back. That Satan has a special strategy of getting you to believe his lies. Because you're not going to wake up one morning and think, I'm going to blow it all. No, you'll get there. Lie at a time. Compromise at a time. Every, every time I get a little bit glum, which is kind of often, that, that like we're a big church, but we're not bigger. Or we're not bigger than. And the bigger than, man, no, there's no greater thief of joy than comparison. And whenever I'm like, oh, we're not, we're good, but we're not gooder than. Then every time I get like that, another one of those super mega pastors by super mega, I mean 10,000 or more, super mega pastors falls. And usually it's sex. And often it's money. And every time in the aftermath, <laughs> the Lord says to me, are you content now, you big baby? And those guys, and they, they are guys, they, they didn't get there overnight. They got there by buying one lie after another. No one will ever know. Just this once. Treat yourself. Lie. From the pits of hell. Identify the lies. Before they become regret. Because the lies that I want you to Identify, they are everywhere. They are atmospheric, these lies. They're, they're in our culture. They surround us like the doctor I was talking to, a physician who told me not long ago, he said, I can't believe we are treating teenage depression with a scalpel these days. A lie. From the pits of hell. Or that billboard that's on I-77, down in Rock Hill. Life is short. Get a divorce. Now, for safety's sake, I understand. For safety's sake, I understand. But for the sake of the cause of boredom, the, the cause I'm, I'm not content, the cause of they're not making me happy anymore, or lies. From the pits of hell. Or even the, the notion that our world is divided into villains and victims. And the more you can identify as a victim, the more you will get ahead. And this kind of thinking pervades our college campuses everywhere, villains and victims. And it comes right from the pages of the Gospel of Marx. Not the Gospel of Mark. Of Marx, as in Karl Marx. And I'm not buying it anymore. Because it's a lie from the pits of hell. Identify the lies before they become regret. And you in your own life, you got way too much going for you to pursue victimhood when you can live in victory, good shepherd. Identify the lies before they become regret. Or even, even the lies that you might be hearing in your own heart and mind today. I mean, we've talked about the atmospheric ones. They're the deeply personal ones. The, the lie where, where the enemy tells you, how dare you call yourself a Christian? You're not a Christian. You're not worthy of that title. A lie from the pits of hell. Or, or even go ahead and post, go, go ahead and post that insult about your ex, about that business, about your coworkers, go ahead and post it on. You'll feel so much better. No, you won't. You'll lose a lot of friends. Why? From the pits of hell. Or even, even 
something that I'm sure that one or two or five of you are even hearing or thinking today. No one will miss you if you're gone. Lies. Damnable lies from the pits of hell. Identify the lies before they turn into regret and then, and then maybe the worst lie of them all. Jesus, he's good. He's wise. He wants me all spiritual and not religious. But at the end of the day, Jesus is like a whole lot of other religious leaders, kind of on a par with Muhammad and Buddha and Moses, lie from the pits of hell, and we have an empty grave to prove it, good shepherd. Identify, identify the lies before they become regret, because no, no one ever started out a day saying, yep, today's the day. This is my to-do list to ruin my life. Instead, you get there one lie after another And do you want to know the best way to protect yourself, the best way to identify the lies before they turn into regret, the best way to look through that windshield of the future of your life before it turns into regret? To be identified by the truth. To know the truth that sets you free. To savor those truths. To adore those truths to let those truths of Jesus define you. That's how you identify the lies before they become regret, by being identified by the truth. You know know what the truths are? You've been bought. you've You've been chased. You've been caught. You're being kept. You have been died for. And what happened to Jesus' body in the resurrection is a down payment on what is going to happen to to your body. Those truths are true whether you believe them or not. And you don't get truer than any of them. And you and I, the more we soak ourselves, saturate ourselves, become surrounded in those kind of truths, take delight in, In those kind of truths, the better we will be able to identify those lies before they become regret. And one of the most marvelous summaries of all those truths that we believe as people of faith is captured in this thing. It's called the Apostles' Creed. And we're going to get to declare it right now. So what I want you to do is, as you're able, I want you to rise on your feet, and the Apostles' Creed is this, we didn't invent it, we inherited it, which makes it so good. We didn't think it up. God sent these truths down, and, and we say, we don't say the Apostles' Creed, oh, I'm said the, no, we declare it with joy and with delight with saints who have been saying it for thousands of years before us. There's one word, I don't want you to stumble over one word. Late in the creed, it says, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And you're like, what? I thought this was Good Shepherd Church. Catholic means universal. It's okay. You can say it. I believe in the church. That's what we're saying. So we are going to declare that these are not just truths that we make up. They are truths that make us. Let's say them together. Declare them together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit 